everybody. Happy Sunday morning. It's good to see you all here. Um, welcome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get right into it here and open in prayer and then hand it over to the coming family. And we'll begin. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for your, your love, your grace, your providence. Lord, thank you for the opportunities we have. Thank you for the opportunities to gather here. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to give back something to you for everything you've done for us. Lord, take, take this offering of worship and may it glorify you, may it bless your name. Be enthroned in our praises and meet us here, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, this morning, our worship is just maybe a little quieter. Um, just we want to remember the Canal family who lost their dad and husband. And uh, we knew them, we're friends with them. And I know there's a lot here uh, in this church who are connected in some way. So let's just um, stand if you feel able to. i 
Father God, I just thank you for this time of worship. I thank you, Lord, for the coming family this morning and, and sharing uh, a beautiful worship with us and that we could join with them this morning in praising you, Lord. Amen. Good morning. <laughs> I have the pleasure this morning of filling in for Birgit to do the call of worship. My family, like many of yours, I assume, um, are having a lot of conversations lately about the days we're living in. Um, between the multitude of issues around the pandemic and our upcoming election, we can find ourselves with vastly different opinions than those that we love and care about. So that's left my family asking the question, how shall we live then in these times? So 2 Timothy 3.16 to 17 says, Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So we know that we can turn to the Bible for our answers. Drop in my notes. <laughs> um, Jesus told us that if we love him, we will keep his commandments. And when he was asked what the greatest commandment is, this was his response. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is none greater than these. The prophet uh, Micah also asked, um, what's required of us? And so in Micah uh, verse, or chapter 6, verse 6, he says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with a calf a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. So we can find that the answers are there, and they're simple answers, just difficult to live out, especially when we feel our opinion is the right one. <laughs> um, I find sometimes myself that I am looking to solve problems that are not my problems to solve. They're God's problems to solve. And what he is asking of us is to love our neighbor, to be there for those in our community, to love him with all our heart, souls, and mind, and strength. Sometimes that means that we need to um, set aside our need to be right. It means that we need to not isolate one another just because our opinions are different, but to love each other in the face of difference and to walk humbly with our God. Let me pray for us. Father God, I pray for myself this morning, just as much as I pray for my brothers and sisters, that each day, you, you've told us not to worry about tomorrow, that it has enough worries of its own, but to just to, to live in this day that you've given us right now. And I pray, Lord, that we would be able to answer yes to the questions. Are we walking humbly with you, Lord? Are we loving you with our whole heart, our whole mind, our whole soul, and, our, and all our strength? Are we loving our neighbors well? Lord God, I pray that you help each of us to answer yes to those questions. That is our call to worship today. Amen.
before we go into a time of prayer, we're going to go through some of the announcements. We do not have the slides for you today, so I'm going to cheat and use the email, which I encourage, we encourage all of you guys to use for announcements during the week, especially when ones come up after Sunday morning. Um, if you don't get that email and you'd like to, uh, come and see any of the leadership. Come and see me. I can plug you in, or if you can contact Shelly directly, she's your best bet to get the announcements email. So there's a YFC fundraiser golf tournament coming up, and it is in September, and you can see Rebecca for more details there. There's Grief Share starting September 14th and running through December 7th. That's Tuesday evening right here at the church in the hall um, to the left as you come in, and that's from 7 to 9 p.m. There is a women's Bible study Wednesday mornings um, right here. Uh, Wednesday evenings from 7 to 8.30 p.m. starting September 15th running through December 2nd. And there is a, yeah, that's the one. Uh, there is a seniors lunch uh, prayer time Senior Zones and prayer time, Wednesday mornings. That's the one Wednesday mornings, 11.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. That started September 1st, um, but uh, I believe uh, this past week it was at McCollum's, but from this week on it'll be at uh, right here at the, at the church again in the hall to the left as you come in. So if you're in high school or you can get them to accept you into high school, then you can go to Viv's house for lunch every Wednesday. They won't let me out of work for that, so I'll skip it. But um, and then there's a love, there's a love and respect. Um, I'm gonna call it a study, couple study right there. Tuesdays with uh, with the Willocks, or sorry, it's led by Bruce and Birgit. Um, that is Tuesdays from 7 to 8.30 p.m. twice a month, uh, starting September 18th. And there's a Friday night intro September 18th from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, and then Mark and Shelley Willick are also doing a, a marriage mentoring once a month for 10 months. Um, one couple at a time, and so you can contact them for more information there. And then we still have the the special um, the special collection or uh, special uh, missions opportunity for Brother A and the um, for the Christians in Afghanistan that we're collecting all the month of September. And then at the end of the month of September, we're going to to give the the funds that we raise here to that. So use use a, a pen and an envelope from the back and just jot down um, what you're giving it for, if that's what it's for, or really for anything. Um, and unless there's any other announcements, that'll do it. And please see your email. Again, if you don't get the email and you'd like to, let me know, and we I can connect you, or Shelly. Um, so now we'll move into a prime of time of prayer. And um, to kick it off, we'll obviously be remembering everybody uh, affected by the loss of Robert Cannell, and he has affected a lot of lives and unfortunately uh, departed suddenly. So we'll be remembering his family for sure. Are there any other prayer requests from the congregation? Brett. We're going to pray for Janine 
and all of the university students in their first week of school. Maybe not as exciting or maybe too exciting their first week back. Um, and Janine will be praying for her and her strength, peace, confidence to, to continue the, the exciting new chapter in, in her study. Anybody else? So we'll, we'll be praying for uh, the Willis's family friend, April, and her son, who had a really rough go with leukemia and miraculously woken up. And so we're obviously very pleased about that. And we, we're just going to continue to pray for his health, and we're going to continue to pray for his, uh, his spiritual health, that he'd, he'd, um, he'd know the, the mental healing and the spiritual healing of, of recognizing his heavenly father. Is there any other? Elijah. So we're going to pray for Elijah to, to get his G license because it's Oh, sorry. To book it, we're gonna we're gonna pray that that comes along quickly and smoothly. We're gonna we're gonna pray for the cardinal and the the Giroux family who have uh, had the loss of a family member, well known for his mustache. That is a praise item, Jill. For those at home, Jill Martin is here today. We're happy to see you. Sarah. We're thankful for the safe arrival of, of Evelyn's nephew and the, the grandchild of, of uh, Alec and Mary and, and, and the health of Pam. I presume it continues to be uh, a good recovery for her, so we're thankful for that as well. So with that, I'll go into a time of prayer, and then we'll hand it over to, to Ruben. Lord, thank you for this, for the many opportunities you've given us through this week, through this morning, Lord, through, through life this far. Lord, we think of the people that we've lost. We thank you for the, the great memories we have of great people we've been able to spend time with, Lord. Thank you for the Cardinal family and the Giroux family and the Canal family and all the other families and friends that the, the loss of the, the person that we've lost has touched, Lord. I pray that you would remind us of the, the blessing and the benefit we have of knowing those people, that those that would be a comfort, Lord, that you ultimately would comfort and, and grant peace that surpasses understanding, help bring people alongside those grieving, Lord, to, to bless them and comfort them and guide them through this experience, Lord. And I, I, I pray for our, 
our youth gone away to school, Lord, for Janine in particular, I pray that you would bless and comfort her, that you would give her um, the support that she needs, Lord, the comfort that she needs, that you would bring new and uh, familiar people around her to, to lift her up, to build her up, to encourage her, uh, to guide her through the experience, Lord, and I just, uh, you, know, you would bless her time there and bless the time for all of our youth away at school, Lord, I thank you for I thank you for new arrivals. I thank you for, for Pam's son and uh, the addition to the Cunning family and the, the health that they have there. And I pray that you would continue to bless that, um, that budding life and that new relationship, Lord. I thank you for the people that we're connected to, and I thank you for the Willis family and their willingness to, to love and reach out and, uh, and to support in prayer. And, Lord, I pray that you would that you would just build up April with strength that surpasses understanding, with peace that surpasses understanding, with focus and presence of mind that doesn't make sense for the, the short amount of rest and reprieve that she gets, Lord, that you would give her everything she needs as a, as for everything that she needs and a testimony of your love in the life of her son, Lord. I pray that you would continue to heal him, Lord, miraculously if necessary, Lord, because you're you're more than enough and more, but most of all, I pray that you would completely and totally heal him mentally and spiritually, that you would meet him in a real and tangible way, that you would bless him with a, a revelation of who you are, Lord. I thank you for Jill Martin and for bringing him back for us to, to be blessed by his presence, and I pray that you would be with all those who aren't able to be here, Lord, for different health complications. I pray that you would be with them and you draw near to them, that you would, um, that you would hold them, that you would meet them where they are this morning, that you would keep them lifted up all throughout the week until you can, until they can return to us here again. Lord, I pray for Elijah. I pray for, uh, I pray for your handiwork to bring about this uh, appointment quickly. Lord, we thank, we think of um, Gabrielle Campbell and how you brought about her appointment so, so much quicker than it was supposed to go, or than appointments tend to go these days. And I, I pray that you would, you would bring that appointment in around quickly for Elijah to, to meet that need, Lord, that you meet our need. I pray that you would bless, bless Reuben now as he comes. I pray that you would guide his words, that you would guide our hearts and our ears to hear and receive, and that we'd be, be changed for, for the message he brings. In Jesus' name, amen. It's one, it's one way to get you awake. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll do it again when you're falling asleep. <laughs> we good? Yeah, I think so. I'm here. I'm going to be looking at it. I think I should be okay. You know, it's been um, a year and a half since uh, I've been up here. And it just seems like the, the whole uh, year and a half during COVID lockdowns and stuff has just gone by like a blur. I don't know about you guys. I feel like it's that movie there where the guy snaps and everyone disappears and then he snaps them back and everyone reappears after five years later or whatever it was. It feels it's almost like that. Um, so a year and a half ago, I spoke about the end times. And uh, so I did a two-part series and we looked at Revelation and we looked at Tribulation and stuff of that. I don't know if you remember. You probably didn't, but that's okay. So what I decided to do... Um, is to continue that theory. So every time, it, it continue that theme. So every time that um, I'm going to be asked to, to come up here, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the end times. I'm going to talk about a certain aspect of it. And I would really appreciate if everyone just lets me know what they think. If they don't agree or if they agree or if they want to talk about something else, or if they want to talk about something specific, that'd be great. Because, you know, when you come here, like every, what, 
four, five, six months, now it's a year and a half, you're not quite sure where everyone's at. And it's really good if you get an idea of what people are thinking about things. So I'm going to be continuing on this because since a year and a half ago, a lot of things have happened. And there's no way these are the end times. Uh, COVID is not one of the plagues. Uh, the, the vaccine is not the sign of the beast. Okay, just up front. Okay, I'm not talking. But there's a lot of stuff that we're seeing going on here that we haven't seen in the past that may set a basis of what we've always been thinking about in the end times. You know, the government intervention of doing things and uh, not being able to do things. Your freedoms are being, you know, like you can't go to the, to, you know, the movies. Big deal. Who cares? But what happens if you can't go shopping one day because you don't have certain qualifications? I'm a pro, I, I va I've been vaccinated, so I'm not talking against vaccines here. But I do respect everyone's rights to, to decide about what they want. I'm just telling you that things are happening now that we wouldn't think possible before a year and a half ago, okay? Um, so what I want to do is I want to bring up some stuff, you know, like uh, just clarify some points because we know the Bible talks about end times, right? We do. But what end times? The end of what? The end of the earth, uh, the end of the church, uh, what do we, as a church, if you're a believer in, in Jesus right now, you put your faith in him, what are you waiting for? Are we waiting for the end of the times where he sets, or we go to heaven forever and ever? Are you waiting for a rapture? Are you waiting for uh, the kingdom to be established? What are you waiting for? And, and who's we? Is it everybody included? Or, or is it just the church? Or just who, Who's we? Everyone who believes in God? In a God? So who's we? So these things, uh, I think we have to be um, thinking about. Jesus commands us. So when the apostles are talking to him, so, you know, Jesus says, you know, this temple that you see is all going to be gone. And then the apostles, the, the disciples, oh, when's these things going to happen? When's the signs of the end of the earth? When is this? Is, when? And they're asking three questions, right? And they're curious. This is what Jesus says, okay? And this is something that at least we have to agree on. Uh, one thing is that we have to be on the alert. Jesus says, therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. We have to be in agreement with that because Jesus told them to the apostles that. So, what I'm thinking, I think if you remember, I do believe in a rapture of the church, okay? And I want to be up front. I, I, the more that I study it, the more I believe it. Uh, I, I think, I know it sounds crazy. But I do believe it because the Bible keeps on referring it to it. So the more I study it, the more I convince that's what the Bible is saying. All right? So what we probably should be looking for is the rapture of the church. I believe it strongly. Okay, let's see here. This is wrong, maybe. It was working before. Okay, because it's not on. <laughs> Oliver, you're going to have to do some work here. You're going to have to. Because it was working before. Oh, there we go. All right, great. So today, I'm just, there's a whole bunch of things to look for. I just wanted to focus on a couple of things here. A few, four things, actually. I might, we might not even get to the fourth point, depending on the time. But um, because of the things that have been happening lately, I wanted to focus first on the denial of Israel. What you believe in of Israel determines everything, pretty much, what you believe about the end times. You talk to people, and, and if they don't believe uh, that Jesus is coming back for the church, it's because they believe that Jesus is going to come and end everything at the time. And it's because they believe that the church has replaced Israel in many things. And, and it, it's not every, I'm sure not everyone believes that, but oftentimes when you talk to people, when I've talked to people in my personal experience, I, I notice that. Well, what do you think about Israel? Well, the church is Israel. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that. The, not the denial of the Messiah, who Jesus is. We're going to be talking about that. And the, den den the denial of the word of God. And also the denial of this reality of the Antichrist, who this person is and what it is, or even if it is something important. 
okay? There's other ones that we can talk about, denial of the end time prophecies, our morals, our faith. There's so many, but we'll focus on these four. What I wanted to do here was just do a quick review about what we talked about a year and a half ago. And as you can see, this is the, sort of the, the sequence that we went through. Um, on your far left over here, Israel was under the law, the Mosaic law, okay? Uh, it was a conditional covenant that made to Israel that uh, if they follow, they can, you know, be sanctified or be set apart. And, and for the large part, they failed. Everyone failed. No one, can, can, no one can do the law. 613 laws, someone will always break it. It wasn't possible. But that's what the Jews were under for so long. Israel was under for so long. And then, of course, Jesus came, okay? A new covenant, a new promise for everyone. A lot of the, there were six other covenants made in the Old Testament. Some of them are conditional. That means I will do this if you do that. But some are unconditional about Israel, saying I will do this for you, period, no matter what. It's a bit like the new covenant. Jesus says, if you believe in me, you will be saved, period. That's it. There's nothing you'd have to do about it. You don't have to give alms, you don't have to give money, you don't have to do, you believe in me, you're saved, period, forever, that's it. It's an unconditional covenant that Jesus made because of the cross. And we have to be thankful for that because there's nothing else that we could have done to, to do that. So now we got here is the church age, okay? And in the church age, this is where everyone's going to be saved uh, under the cross. This is the church age over here. And then we talked about a lot about the seven years tribulation there. And that was in the, a lot about in Revelation. We talked a lot about that a year and a half ago. Today I want to start focusing on over here where we are right now. Okay? Whether or not we're at the end, I'm not going to tell you that, oh, this is really, really soon. But Jesus tells us to always be ready. Okay? So let's always be ready. Let's start studying the scriptures together. Let's start thinking about what's going on here around the world around us. And saying, hmm, maybe this is that. And it doesn't have to be that. If anyone tells you this is for sure, Jesus is coming tomorrow, you know he's wrong. But if someone, let's talk together and say, hey, do you think this is possible? And that's a good thing. It's only a good thing, right? Because well, that's our hope. Our hope is seeing Jesus again. That's, that's what we do communion later on today. Jesus, he's going to come back and we're hoping when he comes back for us, there's no more communion. We're going to have one last communion and that's it. At the wedding feast, and that's it. And, and, and that's our hope. That's our hope. So it's a good thing to talk about it. After the seven years tribulation, there's another coming, okay? So when Jesus comes over here, it's not his second coming, okay? And we're going to look at that today. I just want to lay the groundwork here. He raptures the church. It's not a physical second coming. He's not, the church will be elevated. We're going to meet with him in the air. His second coming is at the end of the tribulation. The Bible is very clear about that. He's going to put his foot on Mount Zion. He's going to vindicate the, the Jewish people because a lot of stuff is going to happen. He's going to physically return. And I believe that he's going to set up a kingdom. Revelation, all throughout the Bible, this talks about Jesus coming as a servant and as a king. He came as both in the beginning. Israel rejected him. Not all Israelites the church started with the Jews. Some Jews, the first church was Jewish Christian church. They were Jewish. But the nationhood, the, the corporate ent ent entity of Israel rejected him. Okay? So he came as a servant on a donkey, and he died for us as a servant. But there's a whole bunch of other prophecies saying he's going to come as a king. So in order for, and I told you last time, these all these little facts are very straightforward in the Bible, the way it's written, the way it seems. When is he going to come as a king? He's certainly not a king now. And we're going to look at what's happening around the world. He's certainly not in control. He's in control, but he's not dictating what things are happening. He's totally in control. This is all in God's plan. There's nothing that happens that God doesn't know about, okay, or he's unprepared for. But God has set a time, and we'll read about that, the time of the Gentiles when things have to happen. So this is the me oh sorry. So this is the, me the the kingdom. Why people refer it to the millennium kingdom is because in, in Revelation, 
It talks about a thousand years. Six times it says it's a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years in the same chapter. So that's why people call it a thousand year uh, kingdom. But the kingdom is talked throughout the Bible. And then is the eternal order. But today we're going to focus on right here where the church is at. Before the tribulation, before what they, they're talking about in Revelation. The rapture, okay, so. <laughs> There's a lot of mocking being done about the rapture. And you know what? In, in, in a sense, I understand it. This is not the only place where things have been raptured. Jesus was caught up in the air when he was gone, and we all believe that. The disciples were there. Jesus was caught up in the air. We believe that. Enoch was raptured. Elijah was raptured. The apostles were raptured. We were talking to the eunuch one day, and boom, he was gone down someone else. Rapture means just taken up. And this is what 1 Thessalonians says where Paul is writing to the people of Thessalonia. He said, don't worry, guys. He says, for the Lord himself will descend with hev from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will be rise, will first to rise. After that, this is what it says, we who are alive and, will, and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Okay? It says it. What do you do with it? If you don't believe in the rapture, then we, ah, well, we'll talk about what some people do. But what does it mean? All right? So he hasn't, here we're going to be caught with the Lord in the air. He hasn't returned on the ground like it says his second coming will look like. All right? So why isn't everyone convinced of the rapture? Lot, lot, just churches, uh, uh, schools these days are, are getting away from uh, maybe, I don't know. I'm just speculating here, and I just don't know. But a lot of the, the pastors coming out of schools are, are going down a little bit with the supernatural events of the future because they sound crazy. <laughs> it does sound crazy, right? But after, I'm suggesting to you that after this whole COVID issue going on stuff, eh, I can see how things can happen. You know? I can see how... In some countries now, you can't even, you, you, you can't trust your internet to tell you the truth, right? It's controlled by the governments. Here it's not, okay? I'm not, I'm not conspiracy theory. But, hey, I can see how a Christian in North Korea can't go and, and look at the Bible online. And we all got our phones. We, no one has, you know, we, even now, I mean, who's brought their Bible? We don't need it, right? We, but I know a couple of people have forgot it. I get it. You know? And there's nothing wrong. There's no condemnation. I'm not trying to suggest that you're evil or anything. But remember, be aware of what's going on in the future. Maybe you've got to bring the Bible, the, the book out, because maybe one day, and I'm not suggesting, but I'm just saying, we've got to start preparing for how this end times can happen. We should know our Bibles. And we should probably have a copy somewhere. So the first point is the denial of Israel. Okay, so we, we all heard about Afghanistan, right? And the Taliban going in. So the Taliban and ISIS, one of their main goals is the destruction of Israel. Destroy? Why? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, if you, look, I know why, because spiritually we know why there's a hate there. Okay, we know. But if you were to think outside the box and say, okay, I don't believe in the Bible, I don't believe why do you care so much about Israel? They don't own anything. They got a little piece of land, man. You got everything around you. Like, you, they stand up in the UN saying, we got to destroy Israel. Thing is, is that that hate, as a believer, you're gonna, you start, we start to see it now in society. And hate's a big word, okay? I, I, I know. And probably no one says, I don't hate Israel. But our thoughts on Israel may be slowly changing as a church, as a Christian, as an individual. I don't know. What do you think? And I'm not saying, okay, I agree with everything Israel does. They're all perfect. What do you think about the stance of Israel in the future? And this is a question that we're going to see. Every time you read something about the Taliban, check out the comments. I love checking the comments. You get a pulse of what people are thinking. Oh, yeah, yeah. Everyone hates Israel. I mean, maybe all the haters are the ones who are writing and the lovers just don't write, right? But Everyone hates Israel. Why? And as a Christian, as believers in Jesus, who's a Jew, 
who is the king of the Jews, who will come back reigning. The Bible says he comes back reigning as a Jew. Why would we say, yeah, Israel's got to be wiped out? They're the cause of all the problems. If you have that thought, I, I, I urge you to discuss it, uh, you know, and talk about it. No one's going to condemn you for thinking. Yeah, right now, go. <laughs> It's a good question. You, yeah. So he's asking, why don't we know about what's happening in, in, in the Taliban and Afghan? We know everything about COVID. Every day we get, you know, the updates of how many cases there are and what may happen in the future and stuff. Why do we? I, I don't know. Maybe people are not. Maybe people are tired about the Middle East issues. Okay. Maybe people. Maybe. This is part of why, what's going to happen in the future. Because if you guys remember when I said about the tribulation, there's going to be a point where everyone gathers against Israel. There's a point where everyone's like, let's get rid of these guys. It's in the middle of the tribulation where all the nations are going to be gathered against Israel, against Jerusalem. And a lot of Jews, people are going to die. So maybe it's a preparation for that. You know what? As Christians, we can't prevent the future. We can't. God's going to do what he's going to do. And we can't encourage it to come either because it's, we don't. But we, what we have to do is do our part and understand what's going on and love our fellow Jews. Paul calls us to make them jealous. We have their Messiah. Can you believe it? Thanks for their stubbornness. They kept the scriptures intact, the lineage of Jesus in line because they didn't intermarriage. And if they did, they were killed. They, they kept that lineage in line so they can trace, okay, this is the Messiah is going to come from David. It's going to come from this. Jesus fit the bill perfectly. So we have to be thankful for the Jews. Right now they're far from God. They're not saved. No. Oh, some of them are saved, obviously, if they put their faith in Messiah. But we have to be thankful for them. So I think, yeah, you're right. We, but as a Christian, I think we should, every time we hear something in the news, not every time, but if you say, oh, that's kind of odd. Oh, we're going to, um, there's a new bill saying that we're going to restrict some internet access. Some of it's a good idea, I guess. So, you know, you want to get rid of the, the bad sites there. Okay, but what are you going to restrict? It's interesting. I just, hmm, there's nothing. I'm not telling you to, to fight against it. I'm not so. But as a Christian, in the end times coming, Jesus coming back, just so, hmm, what's, what does that mean? Okay? So, yeah, good question. I, I, maybe people are not interested. I don't know. So how did this happen? Okay, so, how, so here we read about, you know, Thessalonians, okay? And we said, hey, you're caught up in the, in the eye. In this clouds, what does that mean? I don't know. I mean, this is what happened, okay? So a long time ago, Augustine, he made this method of reading the Bible more properly. It wasn't him who invented it. it was he, he learned it from uh, his schooling and stuff like that back in 300s, okay? And it was reading the scriptures allegorically, meaning... That the literal meaning is not the literal meaning. So today what we see is sometimes, and you will hear it as spiritualized Israel, saying, oh, the church is a spiritualized Israel. So when the Bible talks about Israel, it's talking about the church. Or, or, or here, it, it, this is an example of, of what people do when they you know, talk about allegorical stuff. So you're reading in the story that there are two neighbors are throwing rocks at each other. An allegorical read of this saying, oh, this is a hidden story about the war of two nations. So you see, oh, okay, so there, there's some stories that parables that we see are like that. But if you do it at every single time, maybe this is a nine-year-old kid who's saying, I'm writing about two neighbors who are writing about this. That's what it means. No, 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 it means this because there's a hidden message there, and I'm telling you what it is. I'm suggesting if you read the Bible without any hidden messages in there, and just read it. Just read it for yourselves and say, okay, well, you know, this is, uh, I, I think it's good. And I'm going to give an example here. Zechariah, okay, spiritualizing scriptures, okay. I'm going to read this to you straight out without any thinking, okay. In Zechariah 31, 31 to 36, it says, Behold, 
the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with them or their fathers in that day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, the Mosaic covenant, the covenant that was made to Moses. My covenant which they broke, though I was husband to them. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more will, shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. For the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, their sin, and I will remember no more. <laughs> Allegorically, well, reading it straight up. Who's he talking about? House of Israel, house of Judah. Are we that? We're not that. Unless you make it allegorically. Oh, yeah, it says that, but it's not really that. And this is what happens when you start taking, some, and, and this, of course, applies to us because we're under the new covenant. So we, it, what it applies to the Jews here, it applies to us as well in the sense that our heart, is, the law is written in our heart, right, with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will convict any Jewish person who's saved right now at the same way. But this talks about a day in the future when a new covenant will be made specifically with those guys. The same covenant that he's made to the world will be made specifically to, to those guys. To the house of Israel and the, uh, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I don't belong to those houses. My lineage does not go through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Sometimes I wish I, I was, right? That would be kind of cool when there's no persecution against the Jews. Everyone wants to be a Jew when there's no one wants to kill them, right? But, and then when everything's peaceful, oh, I want a Jew, I'm a Jew. But, you know, the Jews have gone through a lot of persecution. And, and I think, you know, but I am not a Jew now, and I don't belong to this. So this passage, I read it, and I see it, it's for the house of Israel, okay? Another way, in Romans, let's go to the New Testament. This is what Paul says. And he's talking about what happened here, you know, like Jesus came and, and he opened up salvation to the world through, through, through Messiah, which the world's got. This is where he, Paul is saying, hey, our job now is to make the Jews jealous because we have the Messiah that they rejected. And Paul, of course, being a Jew, so it's a corporate Israel that we're talking about here, right? And this is what he says, for I not, do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. So all Israel will be saved as it is written. The li deliverer will come out of Zion and he will not turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them that when I take away their sins. Who is all Israel? Is, what does that mean? If you take a look at what it says, it means all Israel will be saved. Does it mean every single Israelite? No, it's the same way that not every single Israelite accepted Jesus, like all the, all the apostles, the start of the church. But the corporate Israel rejected Jesus. The corporate Israel will call him back. And you know when that's going to happen? I'll show you where it's going to happen. I'm, I'm not going to be able to finish this, but this is where it's going to happen. So over here at the end of the tribulation, I, I, if you guys remember, um, the nations will go against. Okay, so at the middle of the tribulation, Satan will be thrown out of heaven. He comes in and he's going to be so angry and he wants to kill the God's people. So he, he, he gets all the nations against Israel and he, and he wants to destroy them. He goes into Jerusalem. He kills a lot of people in Jerusalem, maybe two-thirds of the inhabitants. Some escape. Some escape into, into the place called the land of, of Petra. There's a lot of canyons. There's places to hide. And at the last moment, the Israelites call out to Jesus. The last moment, and Jesus comes back. Because Jesus says to them before in the New Testament, I won't come until you call me. And Jesus will come back when the Jews reach out for him. Right there and then, Jesus comes with a, and he avenges everybody. There's not much of a battle that happened. And then he sets up, over time, a few days, the, the, the kingdom, and he sits on the throne of David in Jerusalem. And he has this reign, okay? So all of Israel will be saved one day. That's what the scriptures teach, I believe. 
I'm just going to go for one more denial before we go into. Because uh, this one's important. The denial of the son. Okay. And it says here, and in 1 John 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess that, does not confess Jesus, is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is now already in the world. So the idea of the spirit of the Antichrist has already existed since. As soon as Jesus left, Satan was coming in and he was giving ideas. The spirit of the Antichrist. And the spirit of the Antichrist, Antichrist means to stand against Jesus, what he stands for. So that, those ideas came uh, right away. And this is what the Antichrist will be. The Antichrist, the Bible teaches, is a person. And it's a physical person. And he will stand against Jesus, what he represents. And what does Jesus represent? Who is Jesus? In Micah 5, 2, one verse, there's so many verses. You can spend here hours talking about it. It says here, but as for you, Bethlehem, too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you, one will come forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His times of coming forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. He always existed. Who has always existed? The Bible teaches the only one, only God existed forever. Jesus existed forever. That means Jesus is God. Anyone who rejects that, is the spirit of the Antichrist. Okay? And here, this is another, uh, one of many, many references about a kingdom. He will be a ruler in Israel. I think we all see that this is Jesus, right? Bethlehem, the reference about Jesus of Bethlehem. He will be a ruler. So there, again, there's a, a reference about a kingdom. And who he is, he is God. But yet, We still have trouble believing what Jesus did for us. And in Hebrews it says, for, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. What Jesus did, if you put your faith in him, you're saved forever. You're sanctified, you're set apart once and for all. That's what sanctification means. You cannot do anything to make you more saved. You cannot be assured of your salvation if, if your salvation depends on what you do in the future. What happens if when, I don't know, 10 years' time, I don't know, you read a book and it transforms your mind and, 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 okay, you're gone. Does that make you less saved? That means your salvation depends on you keeping good works. Jesus is sufficient for your salvation. You have to keep up your sanctification, the process of getting more Christ-like. But that does not mean salvation. You are saved forever. If you put, now, who do I know is saved? I don't know. I don't know your hearts. I don't know what you did. You've been baptized. Okay, that's great. That's between you and God. I, I don't tell anyone, well, you're not really saved because I've seen you go to that movie. And it doesn't, that's not how it works. It's between salvation. between the person and God. Okay? It's not about well, what the Bible does tell us. If someone is straying away, what to do? And just says, you know what? He just can't be preaching in your church, right? That the guy is going to, uh, you know, a, a Satan church or something, and then he comes and preaches. Like, oh, no, obviously you can't. The Bible is very strict. You got to excommunicate. Show him his errors. Say you can't be, and, and it says excommunicate, and hope that he comes back. But never about salvation, okay? So, but a lot of people have have this thinking in the church that who the Messiah is is not enough. We have to do something. So, as a church, what do we look for? So it. it Churches who, or, or teach uh, doctrines or, or things that are teaching that, that Jesus is an angel. Jehovah Witnesses teach that. They elevate people to his level. Roman Catholic Church teaches that Mary is a co-redemptress. Muhammad is like Jesus, a prophet, but he's a little bit higher. He's the final prophet. Okay? Or other religions say, oh, yeah, Jesus was a great man. He was a great teacher. Buddhism, Islam, uh, Hinduism teach that. And how these are things that affect your life 
is how you view yourself in Jesus. And, and that church, and, and, and if you doubt that, in the end times, when something comes and, and shakes your foundation, you'll lose that. And, and how could the Bible says in the end times that some of us will even lose our faith, our, our trust, but not our salvation. How is that possible? If we're unsure of who we are in Christ, we have to know who the person of Jesus is. He's our Messiah. He's our Savior. We put our trust in him. He's done everything on that cross. Anything I do from now on, it's like a grain of sand in a world of, of, of a beach. It doesn't make, we do nothing to contribute to our salvation. We can't. What he did on the cross is just too much. I won't get to the other points, but we're going to go into communion now. And this is a good part because this is what we're commanded to do, right? We're, we're in a communion, we're commanded to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. We're commanded to do this until he comes back again. So that's what we'll do. And I'm going to read. And I hope everyone's got their little cups here with the bread and everything. Does anyone need one? Just uh, we, we pick it in the back. Alex, you can come in and uh, pray here. I'm just going to read the scriptures that indicate about. And, and you know what? This is, does tie in with the end times because we're supposed to do this until Jesus comes back again. All right? And one day in heaven we won't be doing this anymore because there's no need. In Matthew 26, verses 26 to 28, it says, And while they were eating the Passover meal, okay, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup, the cup of redemption, the redeeming cup, and he says, Which is, for this, is, okay, so he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is to be shed on behalf of many for forgiveness of sins. So I'll ask uh, Alex to pray for the, the table. Lord, we just bow our heads before you. We're just so thankful that we have this opportunity to, to come together as believers and to uh, follow your command to, to uh, remember you in this way. We thank you for giving us the elements of the bread to remember your body that's been broken for us and for the juice of the wine to help us to represent the blood that you shed for us, Lord. It's just, just a reminder of how much and how deeply that you loved us. And we just thank you for that opportunity, Lord. We just love you and we're so happy that you love us. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'll just ask everyone to just tear up the top portion of this. It looks sterile, but I think the principle is there. We can imagine uh, on the Passover meal, Jesus taking the bread, and I can't open it right now, so I'm just going to ask you guys to take the bread and just, <laughs> no, not <laughs> betrayed, okay. All right, thank you. And Jesus said, take this, for this is my body, which he's going to break for us on the cross. He's taking our punishment for us. Take this. And after that, he, he took the cup, the redeem, redemption cup. And he says, take this, because I'm going to shed my blood for you, and I'm going to redeem you. Until I come again. And this is what we're hoping for. He's going to come again. Thank you. Lord, we just thank you. We just thank you for the scriptures. We thank you how what you did, it's so clear that you took it all for us. And that you're center of it. You're center of history. You're center of the universe. You are the creator of all. We just thank you for what you did for us on that cross, Lord, and we just pray that we don't get shaken in our faith. We don't get shaken in fear for what we see around us or what's going on around us. Lord, we just know that you're in control and your timing is perfect. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Go and represent him well.